Welcome back to the Growing Band Director Podcast. This is episode number 166, How the Time Flies. Hanging with Jake Sturdivant. Jake, how are you? Doing great. We just did the whole thing and realized we didn't talk about repertoire, and that's mm-hmm. a bad thing. So um, one of the pieces you mentioned was Adrian Sims' Incandescent. Yes. And you said you really liked it because it was minimalist. Mm-hmm. And then we said, okay, what else is there out there that's minimalist? And we couldn't think of very much besides Snowflakes Dancing by Andrew Boys and Jr. So yeah. um, people should send me some recommendations for, and I'll put it on the Facebook group too. For sure. Um, why do you like minimalist music? Yeah, so I, I think it's so great for our us to be able to work with students um, to look at different styles that uh, they might not necessarily um, gravitate towards, but also they're not going to hear um, as much. And working with minimalism stuff allows us to talk about a lot more with texture and colors um, and moving away from melody driven stuff. So I think that it's really important. And Adrian Sims doesn't really come out right and tell us that this is inspired by minimalism with this particular piece, but there's so many elements here that kind of are, are working within that context and that, that frame. Uh, so I've been just starting this uh, piece with my students and working on it and they're really enjoying it. And it allows for some space to be able to talk about how minimalism works and how it's shaped and how do we how do we listen to those colors and textures changing and very rhythmic in nature as well. Cool. And you had another piece you wanted to mention too? Yeah. So um, I, I've always wanted to do uh, Stravinsky's Rite of Spring with the concert band um, and it struggled to be able to find uh, good arrangements of it. Uh, but this one by Robert Buckley that I was able to um, find is is just stellar, really well arranged and super um, uh, accessible for mm-hmm. the students to be able to kind of understand uh, a lot of the key moments in Rite of Spring, but also um, we're, we're working through a lot of good things musically as an ensemble while we're learning it. Sweet. A piece that came to my mind people may know is um, Shenandoah, the arrangement that's mm. been done. I don't know if you'd call it an arrangement. He uses Shenandoah by Omar Thomas. Yeah. It's so good. There's so much blues in there. The low flute at the end mm. gets me every time. Yeah. I love it. And the rain sounds and it's like, it's like not, and I've never heard Shenandoah like it yeah. before. That's awesome. I'm hoping it becomes a real staple piece. I think it's pretty popular. I think it came out in 2019, Yeah. but I think the more people listen to it, it's just a great piece. Great. That's great. Good. We're going to do a, an episode here on two very different things, but things you're an ep- expert on that I think will help a lot of people. The first one is an arranging project with your band. Yeah. Um, and the second one is how to um, improve your jazz piano players. Mm-hmm. So Absolutely. I think everybody needs that unless you don't teach jazz band and then what's wrong with you yeah, so exactly um so we're hanging in your band room because yeah. i have a snow day yep Looked all my all my landscaping in my house which we did not make but we like moved in the house it's like destroyed Ooh. there's how there's like trees like snap trying nice. to get out of your work right now right now. yeah yeah <laughs> it's like i it's so covered in snow i don't even know what is good and what's bad and all yeah. that yeah so I totally get that thanks for hosting me yeah for sure it's thanks for fun. coming over um so where do you want to start yeah, so I'd love to talk about this arranging project that I do with the students. So this is something that basically when I was I was um, at Bonnie Eagle High School when I started formulating some ideas for this. Um, and what was going through my mind at that point is um, I really wanted to work on ear training stuff with my students. And I wanted to work on composition and or arranging elements with my band, my concert band students. And... Uh, I I was kind of frustrated thinking back to my days of ear training in college and mm-hmm. thinking, oh, I'm just going to plunk intervals, you know, and and have my students do that sort of thing where it's pencil and paper and worksheet all the time. So instead of doing that, I figured, why not try to do it in a, a real world sort of setting and have the students engage with uh, trying to be able to listen, listen to a piece um, and have an opportunity to figure out how to play along with that piece, um, but also go through the process of recording uh, or, or understanding how to arrange for an ensemble mm-hmm. so that we can put together a, a performance of it. So that's really where it started from. And then based on that, um, every year I've kind of done more with it to try to uh, hone in how to allow the students to be able to choose the piece. That's kind of the big Part of it is mm-hmm. they actually have to agree on a piece for us to be able to arrange. Mm-hmm. And then they have to go through a learning process. So they figure out how do I transpose for my instrument? How do I transpose for all the rest of our instruments? How do we speak the same language so that yeah. instead of talking about um, uh, B flat, now we're talking about one or three or whatever that might be using numbers. 
um, or soul fedge, but most of the time we use numbers and allow for the students to be able to go through the process of learning a tune, um, basically just with a chord sheet. So that's all they get from me. They don't get any, any other notation and they have to be able to use their ears to, to learn all of the parts, whether that's melody or the chords that they're playing, they have to learn all of those parts and then develop um, an idea for how do we arrange this for our ensemble. So you do this in your full band class? Yeah. Yep. Okay. And then about how much time do you take? Do you do it like for a couple of weeks straight or do you like do it as part of a rehearsal yeah. continuously or what? Yeah. So basically what we do is uh, I treat this as, as one of our pieces for okay. um, a concert season. So you rehearse session. it like you would any other piece. So it's we're gonna rehearsing get just like ev every other piece that we're going to be working on. Um, we give it 20, sometimes 30 minutes, depending on the class period. Yep. Um, and we just go through the process of uh, what's our next steps? What are the things that we need to do now to be able to make progress? Okay, on our so I have some qu some questions. Yeah. One of them was answered. So you, every kid is not doing an arrangement. You're doing a group arrangement. Okay, Correct. got yeah. that. Check that one off the list. Um, what are the what are their given parameters? Like what what can they what are they allowed to do? Yeah, so that's uh, really what I tell the students is this is going to be your piece. So you guys get a chance to choose however you want to arrange this. Um, I also tell them at the the get go, you do not have to play your band instrument for this piece. If you are a closeted um, guitar shredder, pull it out for this piece because that's going to be great. If you want to do some vocals on this piece, let's do some vocals on this piece as well. That's totally fine and, and par for the course. A lot of it is really just engaging the students in thinking through how are you going to become an arranger now and how do you make this piece work for your ensemble that you have? Okay, so choice of material. Mm -hmm. Do you have veto power? Like, is there a time where you go, okay, we're not doing that? Yeah, or... that's, a, that's a great question. So most of what, we're go what we do is go through the process of let's learn the, the skeleton of the piece. Let's figure out all of the chords for the song, make sure that we can play along with the recording and just play some, some whole notes are totally fine. So how do you choose recording. what piece you're gonna do? Do you assign yeah. them one or do they all? No, they, so let's start from the get go. So basically there's this whole song selection process that I use and uh, I'll uh, put the Google doc in there for you to basically see the arranging process, but um, students will go through a voting process. Okay. So they, they put forward um, in whatever f format that they want, usually YouTube links or Spotify. These are the songs that they think would work best for the ensemble. And then we go through a series of voting in so, the class. So every kid can like crowdsource, like throw anything in. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So we'll, we would see all kinds of them if we looked for, through what happened this past year. And usually this takes about half a class period for, for this sort of work. And basically the students put their, their ideas out there. We listen to little bits of them. We go through a, a voting process and cull it down to uh, three pieces or so. And then they have the final say. The majority wins and we end up um, choosing that piece based on that. And no, I don't have veto power. I mean, there's been years that I wish I had veto power. <laughs> uh, we, uh, I forget there was, um, uh, there was a Gangster's Paradise, we did a couple of years yep. ago. So I kind of wish I had some veto power on that one. But they did a great job with it. Uh, there was just very limited things going on for that particular piece. But yeah. So um, so do they? everybody gets a lead sheet and chord changes? So they don't even get a lead sheet. That Basically, they just get chord changes. So I, I take it off from usually Ultimate Guitar, um, and I give them uh, the chords and the lyrics for the tune. And you always do it in the original key? More. We always start with the original key, and then based on that, they can make the choice whether or not they want to transpose the whole thing. Okay. Yeah. And that becomes a lot of work, but yep. we've done it. So walk us through as someone who's done it a bunch. Yeah. So how, where do you go from there? So most uh, once we have the tune, I'll throw them out the worksheet, which basically has um, an overview for here. here's the key that we're in for this song. Um, and it allows them to be able to see uh, all of the transposed um, scales, but they have to actually go through the scale construction process. So they figure out we're in a major key, we're in a minor key. I give them holes and half steps. And then I also give them uh, the ability to figure out what are your scales for E flat instruments and B flat instruments, as well as the concert key. Um, I've done it with F instruments as well in the past. And I have them do all the transpositions uh, for all of the chords for the song on one side of the paper. On the back side of the paper, it has all the chords and the lyrics for the tune. So that allows them to kind of see the form of the tune as well as those chords. 
And then from there I say, okay, it's time to transpose this for your instrument. So yep. whatever instrument that you're doing, you need to choose one note for every single one of those chords on, on the back side and voice lead. And we go through voice leading process, voice lead for your instrument so that you can go through that yep. and play along with the recording. So the, do they have to write out the melody for themselves or they can transpose it by, by sight or. Yeah. So a lot, once we get to the melody stuff, what happens is uh, I basically say now, now that we have the chords for the tune down, we're play we've played through the chords. Now it's a matter of trying to figure out the melody. So let's go through and, and find the, the melody notes. And we'll do that as a class for more ear training sort of things. Let's do this phrase. Once the, uh, one of the students has it, they have to learn how to communicate that to everybody else. So then mm -hmm. they go through the process of saying, oh, it starts on eight. And they'll tell us what the notes are using numbers. There's no transcription as far as rhythms or anything like that. They have to figure out that melody by ear. And then uh, everybody in the ensemble will go through the same process. And this includes percussionists. Percussionists are jumping on mallets and keyboard instruments as we're learning the melody and the chords for the tune as well. How's class environment as you're doing this? They're usually really engaged. So that's the great thing about this project is they all want to learn the tune, right? And they have that motivation already for wanting to learn the tune. And they, they love, uh, most of the time, they're really engaged in learning um, what they need to with the melody and the chords. The cumbersome time is when we have to make some decisions for it to sound like an arrangement for the piece. Mm -hmm. So instead of everybody doing whole notes or half notes or whatever, we got to go through a process of how do you work on um, making this sound more energetic and lively or fun uh, for the ensemble. So will you give them suggestions? Like, yeah, I would suggest right here, the brass plays only, and then maybe the woodwinds play so a lot of the times what I'm going to do is kind of guide the process. So I might say very, this is also really important um, to looking at the repertoire that we're doing currently, right? Is we will take a section of uh, a tune um, uh, this, this past year when we were doing it, we were working on a couple of um, uh, fantasy adventure at the movies, which has a whole bunch of great, Michael Brown. Yes. It's a great arrangement. It's a really good. It's got uh... Um, Back to the Future Back in to the it. Future. It's so good. But out of the reason that I got it this year was Princess Bride theme is yep. in there. And there's yep. like, you can't go wrong when you get Princess Bride mm -hmm. going on in there. So that was great. So uh, what was awesome about uh, every time that we do this is I take a piece like that and I say, let's play this section. Tell me what's going on for the accompaniment. Right. So then the kids have to say, oh, that's interesting. We got a little arpeggio happening in there. And then we say, could we try an arpeggio in our piece? So then we go through the process of uh, using whatever that arranger did for that piece and trying it in the midst of. So our maybe piece I missed this, but is this a piece you, like the Fantasy Adventures movie that's also on the same program? Or it's on the just, same like, program. Okay. Yeah. So, so you, same program. you choose something that you know is you're, you're going to be able to teach. Exactly. And transfer to the other piece. Exactly. Yeah. Something that we're currently doing. Uh, sometimes I've done pieces that we've we've heard in the past, right? Um, another really good teaching thing is I, I usually jump on YouTube and pull up an arrangement of whatever the pieces they're arranging. So this year they did, one of the groups did everybody wants to rule the world. Right. Yeah. So then I jump into YouTube and I find an arrangement, um, uh, like there was a whole bunch of them out there, but there was a saxophone player who, uh, recorded himself doing all the parts. Yeah. Right. And then I say, what do you hear that he did? What do you like? What do you dislike? Yeah. What are the things that he did to arrange it? And that allows them to have that critical ear of saying, oh, that's interesting that he chose not to put the counter melody, right? So then they hear the elements of being able to subtract things as well as add things so that we don't always have to stick to what the original is. Mm -hmm. We can also add things to our uh, and subtract things in our own arrangement as well. It's cool. Yeah. So then it's it's a piece on the concert. Exactly. So the and usually they're almost always going to choose a song that is um rock pop oriented uh i there have been a few like um we did one from zelda the other year so there's been a few pieces that have been a little bit less um uh focused on uh vocal stuff right but anytime that there's vocals they choose whether or not there's going to be a vocalist and then we discern determine how do we want to look on stage so most of the time what ends up happening is we become this huge rock ensemble and everybody comes to the front of the stage all the horns are right at the front. We got a rhythm section happening. And then you got a chance to be able to have a completely different sort of performance than you would when you're in that concert. Do they itself. end up writing other stuff down as they do it? Like take notes or mm -hmm. they like write apart or? Exactly. That's the great thing is that basically I say, this is all you're going to get from me. 
So whatever you need to know, you need to figure out how to write down for yourself. Yep. And we don't go over things like how do, how do you transcribe and figure out what the rhythm is and how do you figure uh, how do you write that rhythm? Yep. We don't go through that process. We just basically say you write down however you're going to remember it, and then from there, you need to remember how to play it when we get to the the performance. So, do you ever archive? Like, do you have a way of keeping them? Yeah. So great thing, like this this past year, uh, my other class. So I have two sections of concert band. Each of them chooses their own piece. So one of them did Everybody Wants to Rule the World. The other one did Take On Me, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I had already done Take On Me because that ended up happening a few years back, right? So then I ended up having a whole bunch of stuff already set to go for that, for for being able to pass, pass out worksheets and also um, to reference. For the so students. do you ever do a thing where, okay, it's summertime or, or after the whole thing's settled and you say, and you take it, and you basically like write it out so you have it like as a score have you ever done that I've never done that it would yeah. be it would be interesting to do that process but the thing is I don't know everybody's parts yeah. what I usually do is I go through and keep a google doc and I and I, that google doc basically is just I jot down shorthand decisions that the group makes so for instance flutes have melody during the verse right or saxes are taking the chords but they're split and that's all I write. I don't know who's playing what part. I don't know who's on the third, who's on the one, right? Those sorts of things are all, they figure that out. Um, so if I were to go back and try to transcribe that and then try to write out those parts, yep. that would be an interesting thing to be. Are there ever times that. you have to stop, step in and like they think something sounds good and you're like, there's yep. something totally wrong? Yep, yep. Um, and most of the time, this, this is the great thing is they hear it. Right. Yeah. Then they're like, wait a second, this is not working the right way. Yeah. Um, and they call each other out on it. And that's really great. But there there's a lot of the times where I am guiding them in some way. And I'm basically saying, especially after the point where they make decisions and then I'm like, this is not really working really well. Right. From my perspective, I'm hearing that I can't hear the melody at all, you know. And maybe we shouldn't have put all the brass on the chords during that section, right? <laughs> so then when then I get a chance to be a little bit, I come into my arranger mode rather than my class teacher mode. And I allow them to kind of hear uh, an alternative view of how I might go about arranging it slightly different. It's funny because you come at it, at it from a piano player. Mm -hmm. um, so you understand harmony. Yep. Um, and you're a writer, yep. right? Arranger and composer. Mm -hmm. So like what what about a teacher who maybe would like to do this but doesn't have that background of skills yeah, yeah. so that's why uh, every time that i've talked to people about this i i basically try to indicate that I, the simpler the better right even if you take and do something like this um, with your students that has three chords in it right and then that way you're starting from uh, a place of you're in a little bit more understanding of the tune you could even plunk things out on a, on a keyboard for them to be mm -hmm. able to hear, right? So it's very simple. Um, that allows people to be able to start from a starting point of, oh, I, I can kind of see how this might work for my ensemble. Before I forget, yeah, how do people reach out to you if they want to know more about how you do it? Yeah, for sure. So they can definitely email me, um, uh, and you can put my email in the, in the notes for sure, but my school email, uh, jacob.sturtevant at falmouthschools.org, or my personal email, jakesturt at gmail.com. And uh, you can, I have a website there as well where I've taught some workshops in the past and have some uh, materials up on there as well. But any, reach out to me for sure. And I'm happy to and help. if anybody is driving and they can't do that, they can just reach out to me and I'll send them your way. Sounds great. Yeah. <laughs> sounds great for sure. Um, so I've done a, a ranging project a little bit differently, but I've, I do it in a music theory class, mm -hmm. right? So it's completely yeah. different, but I do think that this real world, actually, I want to, I want to wait on that. Um, so you perform it at a concert. Yeah. So is there like past videos and recordings yeah. and do you ever do something in class as like a recording project or anything like that? So, uh, we, we only did that during COVID times because we yeah. didn't have the, the performance of it to be able to do. So we did a recording during COVID times. We haven't done it as a recording session. Yep. Um, uh, that would be a fun thing to be able to do, especially if kids were super invested uh, to be able to do a, a recording session. In, in but I wonder, do you have, are there videos out there of this? Yeah, that, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, and I can link, a, you can link a couple of them for sure to be able to see um, this sort of um, at least the end result product. Yep. Uh, the, in class stuff is really where it all happens yep. right and that's the toughest thing is to to figure out how do you come to consensus with a whole bunch of people but here's the thing is those are good skills that the kids are going to need to learn anyway yep. right so then you do 
have an opportunity to teach those strategies right in class for how do we listen to an idea that might not sound great, right? Um, and that's a really good learning experience. What I tr typically t tell the students is when we're in the midst of doing this arranging, we're going to have people give ideas. And sometimes I will call on the kid in the back uh, who's not saying anything and say, what do you think we should do here? And they need to give a suggestion. And then what I also model to the students is we're not going to say that idea is bad. As soon as we hear that idea, we might think it's bad, but we're going to give it a shot and we're going to see what it's like and come to a conclusion together of whether or not it works for us. So I wonder if you could take like, how many years have you done this? So I would say at this point, 12 or 13 years. Yep. Yeah. So I wonder if you could go back and like make a compilation, mm -hmm. right. And be like Falmouth through the years or, yeah. you know, yeah, or yeah. whatever. That's yeah. a cool thing. No, it's, it's totally a fun thing. And when I was at Bonnie Eagle, I used to do it as a guest artist thing too. So I'd bring in somebody like Chaz Lester, uh, who's a great beatboxer vocalist from the, from the area. And I'd be, I'd bring him in to kind of be the featured um, act uh, for the evening but then I'd also say to the band you guys get to perform with him and he's going to sing whatever tune that you've decided yep. on and then they have to they're super invested because they're like oh man we got to make this work really well so that when this guest artist comes in and performs it with it we're yeah. going to sound good my brain is even going like I think this is a great thing my brain's even going like okay what if you took all the YouTube videos and then you just made the audio files from those mm -hmm. and made that an album on, on iTunes or absolutely you know yeah. so the kids can have that and share it yeah yeah, yeah. and this is I, I will tell you that this is probably the thing that I hear most from alumni too, when they come back, when they, when I bump into them wherever they're going to bring up the arranging project. Yep. Cause that's the thing that they remember the most out of their time with me is, Oh, I got to do uh uptown funk or whatever mm -hmm. and go through that process and perform it. And it was super fun. Yeah. Speaking of uptown funk, that's so hard. Yeah, we did that. Yeah. yeah. Bonnie Eagle group did that. And that was, that's a tough one. That was, it took us a while to be able to figure out that because there was tons of horn lines and tr things to figure out for that. And they, they nailed it. And I assume sometimes you simplify stuff too, if you have to, like if it's really hard, you might yep. go, Hey, let's, how can we play this? Exactly. And that's the great piece of that as well is to say, this is another strategy that arrangers use all the time is simplification. Yep. How do we take the essence of what this is and make it easier for us to be able to do? Yeah. I met with Mike Sweeney yeah. a little while ago and he, He's the master at that. Yes, we could is. all be Mike Sweeney. Yeah, for sure. Um, so the way I do it in a theory project is we do it around pep band. So it, it's similar. It's a, a pop music kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and then I give them a lot of guidance along the way. But what we do is that becomes the pep band book. Would we need to play football game or whatever? So like the kids get their name on it. And I'm moving more and more away from the intro verse chorus kind of deal because mm -hmm. you don't usually get that long to play. And yep. they get to be fairly hard. Yep. Um. So we, you know, like the tunes that are four bars, like mm -hmm. those riffs, yep. you know, just some, some basic arranging, but having the kids do it yeah, um, is what I've done. Yeah. How have they liked it when you, they love it. it. Yeah. They love it. And I will tell them like, look, if you really want to do this tune, it's fine, but we're probably not, this is not going to work for our <laughs> band. Yeah. Like it needs to be simple enough for, so I have a bunch that we've never actually played in public, Yeah, but a ton, like our entire library that yeah. I've, a bunch of people have asked and I've shared it with them on Google drive Awesome, um, is all, you know, 15 years of, of kids doing it. And yeah. some are our home runs, Yeah, you know, and you're like, why don't be, because also, I mean, so is this legal? Like, right. I, it's probably like it falls under the educational purposes. Yep. Like we're not making any money on it. Yeah. Just a chance exactly. for kids to learn it. Yep. Um, I think it's a great thing. Yeah, for sure. And I'm, I mean, they're not publishing charts. They're not going through the process of even putting it down into a, an actual established arrangement. You know, they just go through the process of being able to perform it, you know, and see what it, they're a cover band basically mm -hmm. uh, coming up with this uh, in, in their particular ensemble that they have. So that is, uh, that gives them the ownership quality, but it also allows for the learning to happen in a, in a real world situation. Like we think of it as a project and what's the ultimate musical goal, but a lot of other people might call it the flipped classroom, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Like where the kids are kind of, I don't know, anytime I hear the educational jargon, I, my brain shuts off, but yeah, I think, yeah. I think that falls within that. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of it is just to be able to put them uh, for me, I was thinking back to my, my early days of, um, in my rock band at, at home, you know, um, I had uh, four of us get together and we were just jamming out on things, but then we'd have to go through the process of saying, you know, wouldn't it be fun if this happened before that, you know? So then we're, we're going through the process of arranging it mm -hmm. on, on our own um, and trying to figure that out and thinking, 
that's the way that I learned. I wonder how many kids are going to learn going through the same process in, yep. in, a, in a concert band situation. Uh, so, uh, yeah. So a lot of what we, we end up doing is after we go through the arranging process, um, I will make sure that they go through the reflecting process, kind of thinking about how did it go? What are some things that you might have thought about changing if you had more time? Um, but then also they have the opportunity to show me what they've learned. So we do uh, a written assessment um, after uh, the performance is done where I give them a brand new tune with chords, a chord chart on it. And then I have a blank worksheet on the front for their scales and their chords. And then they have to individually go through the process of filling that out and then playing along with the recording with their voice leading that they put together so that they eventually can show me that they can do this independently. Um, and are they usually able to? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So mo almost all the students do quite well on the assessment. So that's really good to be able to see that they're learning this stuff and they're invested in learning it. Um, and then if they don't learn something, we get a chance to be able to see what things they were still not understanding. Because I wonder if there's a part of the process that you do once because you only had to do it once. Yeah. And then in a few weeks or a month, you come back to it and they don't. Because kids, kids don't remember anything Exactly. Right like, yeah anything that's yeah. a whole other yeah. topic but. which which is also an interesting thing and i totally agree with you because there is so many things that my students will forget but this is one thing that because we do it yearly there's the upperclassmen will be like oh i understand this uh, like this year it was great to be able to see some of my percussionists in the back that don't play mallets right coming up to some of my uh, the saxophone player and saying yeah this is how you do this <laughs> and mm -hmm. giving them the process of how do you transpose for your instrument and then how do you voice lead for your yep. instruments so they they get it they grasp it yeah love it yeah. We sincerely appreciate you taking your valuable time and listening to the Growing Band Director podcast. Your students are very lucky to have a band director like you. If you have any suggestions for episode topics or think you have an area of expertise to share on a show with us, please reach out. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe. And if you want to help spread the word, please give us a five-star review and tell your band director friends to subscribe as well. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, our YouTube channel, and wherever you listen to podcasts. Thanks for listening to the Growing Band Director. See you next week.